Have you ever sat down to play that brand new game that you were so excited for, only to be met with some of the most unpolished, unfinished gameplay you've seen in your life? Are you tired of loading up the latest AAA multiplayer game, only to realize that most of the customization options are locked behind a paywall in either an item shop or a premium battle pass? Huh? And have you ever loaded up the sequel to your favorite game franchise for the first time after years of waiting and realized that all of the awesome features and game modes that you loved from the previous games are nowhere to be found? Well, if you or a loved one has fallen victim to the effects of modern gaming like so many others, then you may be entitled to a free consultation. I am Rep Zombie, the gaming attorney, and I will win your case faster than you can say the word microtransactions. Just visit our website at ModernGaming420.com or give us a call at 1-800-DELAY-69. That is ModernGaming420.com or call 1-800-DELAY-69 today to get the care you deserve. This is Rep Zombie Law, the leading force against modern gaming. Now, I know there are plenty of videos talking about the decline of gaming or that gaming is dead and whatnot, but before you click off this video, just hear me out real quick. I will not be going on a huge rant about how games nowadays aren't fun anymore and all that depressing shit that I've been seeing on my YouTube recommended feed. Instead, I will be talking about some of the games in recent memory that had disappointing launches and putting these games under a microscope to figure out exactly why these games ended up the way they did. But here's a little hint, they all seem to have something in common. And after going into what made these games the absolute pieces of dog shit that they are, I will kind of briefly touch on some of the games from recent memory that deserve the most praise and why the industry should take inspiration from the studios that worked on them. But before we move on to the video, I'm going to remind you to give it a like and subscribe to the channel because at least that'll make up for the sanity that I've lost researching these god awful games for the past month. So buckle up ladies and gentlemen and get ready for the pain that lies ahead. Enjoy. To start us off, let's talk about the first game on my shit list. Battlefield 2042 released on November 19th of 2021 as the 12th main installment of the Battlefield franchise. After the disappointment that was Battlefield 5 left the community wondering if the franchise would ever be at the same level as the likes of Battlefield 3, 4, and Battlefield 1 just previously, EA figured that the best thing to do was make a game based around what made the franchise so beloved in the first place, and man did they get people hyped. DICE, the developers behind the Battlefield franchise, had three more studios helping them release this game, making this the biggest dev team behind any Battlefield game to date. And bringing back the more all-out military warfare with 128 player lobbies on a huge map with tornadoes and all this crazy shit, this truly felt like this could be one of the best Battlefield games yet. That is, until we got to October 6th when the Early Access beta released and people got to actually play the game, because it has all been downhill ever since. This fucking game, let me tell you. This game was so buggy during the open beta, it was barely even playable. If you participated in this beta, you couldn't play it for 30 seconds without seeing some sort of visual glitch. The most notable being the seizure-inducing flashes that would fill your screen every few seconds, or when your parachute wouldn't go away when you landed and it would just float above your head, giving away your position. The ladders were also broken and would sometimes cause you to bounce around or start flying away. And when watching another player go up or down a ladder, their animation would play in like 2 frames a second, as if this was a game made in the 90s. You could also jump into the water and stab the surface with your knife, which would then cause you to start swimming into the air, allowing you to fly around the map, and every now and then you'd be loading into a game only for you to get an error message or your game will crash. I will say, this is the worst beta of any game I've ever played in my life, and when players voiced their feedback to the developers, DICE assured us that this build was two months old, because yeah, sure it was. Because with all the bugs this game had, they weren't even half of what made this game the piece of shit that it was, because even though most of these glitches were fixed before the game finally released mid-November, the core of the game that was their post-launch was still not very good. First off, what was most apparent not only through the beta but post-launch as well, was the hit registration, which is probably the worst I have experienced in any game I've ever played. You could dump an entire magazine into someone standing 10 meters away from you and you still won't fucking kill them. And sometimes you were forced to leave a match and join a new one because the revive system was completely broken and wouldn't let anyone revive you because your character's toe was touching a piece of the map's geometry, like a wall or a fucking chair or something. The destructible environments in this game were also incredibly disappointing compared to Battlefield 4, where a whole skyscraper would fall down in the middle of a match. Meanwhile, here is what 2042 has to offer.
Also, if you were to try to land a helicopter on the ground, even touching the ground as slow as possible, your helicopter would just blow up. But on the other hand, you could fly a jet straight into the side of a building and you'll just bounce off. There was also this vehicle drop-off system that ended up being way too overpowered, where you could call in vehicles from the sky like a fucking care package. Like this hovercraft vehicle, which has a turret on the top of it, and can drive up the side of skyscrapers like it's fucking Spider-Man. And you can even fly the damn thing and crash into helicopters and jets mid-air. And there are some maps in this game where you have to reach the top of a tall building in order to capture an objective, and the only way to get up there was by taking the elevator or by parachuting onto it. But for some reason, DICE thought it was a good idea to let players drop off vehicles from on top of these towers, where they could just set up tanks and hovercrafts and hold the objective for the rest of the game. The sandbox wasn't very good either, with only 22 guns to choose from, as opposed to the 37 you could choose from in Battlefield 5. And out of this sandbox, there were a few weapons that were way too overpowered, making it hard to win a gunfight most of the time, unless you got to the level that unlocked that gun, which you would then use to massacre everybody else in the lobby. To make things worse, DICE implemented an operator system where you were forced to pick between these different specialists that were restricted to certain weapons. And here are some of the voice lines for these specialists. I told you to keep up! Ha! This is what I expected! Sometimes they just line up for you. Oh, I'm ready. Oh, I climbed Everest, it's been all downhill from there. You get it? This... this is, is not okay. This needs to stop now. This is cancer. And do you know why the developers took away your freedom to pick and choose any loadout you wanted, and replaced that with a dumb operator system such as this one? Well, how else are you supposed to buy skins in the item shop, you fucking troglodyte? EA has to make their money somehow. Also, this game has an ultimate edition that cost 110 fucking dollars, which gave you a year's worth of season passes, a bunch of skins, and one week of early access to a game that wasn't even half finished when the game fully launched a week later. On top of all these poorly thought out design choices is a terrible, and I mean terrible user interface. Like the button prompts that were so small you had to put your face right up against the screen and squint your eyes to see them. And the settings menu, at least at launch, had a setting that you are told is to change the hit marker sound from the original sound, the Battlefield 1 sound, or no sound. Which which, if you looked at the setting, it only gave you the options of default and off. And worst of all, Battlefield 2042, a game released in 2021, launched without an in-game scoreboard. You know, the thing that nearly every multiplayer game made since the beginning of the Stone Age has had? Oh, and did I mention that DICE decided to launch 2042 without a campaign? They said this was so that they could allocate resources towards the multiplayer, but that leaves the question, where the fuck did those resources go? You supposedly had the biggest dev team in the history of Battlefield games, and you launched a game with no campaign and the multiplayer was still this bad? For that you'd think the game would be like 30 bucks, but no, it's still $60, even though you're getting less content at launch than any other Battlefield had, on top of not having a campaign. But I guess what I'm trying to say here is that the kinds of problems that 2042 had just don't seem like problems that a huge franchise like Battlefield should be having to deal with in the first place, you know? Although a lot of the issues I just touched on have since been patched and all the missing features and content were added in updates since then, the game very clearly flopped on launch with it having less of a player base than Battlefield 1 and Battlefield 5 just a month after its release. And as the feedback from the community was about what you'd expect from a fan base this massive, the developers seemed to respond very poorly to it, releasing one of those statements, but instead of owning up to anything or apologizing to the fans, they actually start patronizing the community, saying things like, we'll be addressing issues that you told us about, or key features that are important to you, as if they weren't aware of everything that was wrong with the game before they released it. DICE also put out a blog post where they said that they will be carefully evaluating the desire to see legacy features return, like a scoreboard, a server browser, and a voice chat. It's like they're acting as if these things are just outdated features that games don't have nowadays. There was also a DICE employee who posted a tweet claiming that the expectations from the fans are just too brutal and that these things take time to implement into the game. Like, first of all, these things were intentionally left out by design. And even if they weren't, just delay the fucking game however long you need to so that these things could be ready for release. I mean, the only thing that was delayed was the item shop in Season 1, because god forbid we don't have a working item shop so that we don't run into any problems when giving them our money. Obviously, what went wrong with Battlefield 2042 is that EA just wanted to push out another unfinished game way too early, without allowing the developers to have a clear idea of what the finished game should look like. I mean, I thought that the number 2042 in the title was put there because that's the year when the game was supposed to be finished. Not only was it super buggy, but the way it was designed makes it clear that they didn't care for what would be good for the players, but instead something they could put out to appease their investors, whether it was finished or not. Only it ended up backfiring on them big time, and now the fate of Battlefield as a franchise is in a dark, dark place. At least it was for a while. Next up on our list we have...
Forspoken was released on January 24th of 2023 and was developed by Luminous Productions, the same studio behind Final Fantasy XV, under the leadership of Square Enix, who was getting ready to release Final Fantasy XVI just a few months later. Now, before this game's release, Square Enix was going through a difficult time trying to expand their talent across other IPs, like with Marvel Avengers and Babylon's Fall, which didn't do as well as Square Enix hoped they would, so what Square Enix did was they grabbed Luminous Productions and they said, Hey, we want to have another shot at creating a fantasy game in a brand new IP. Can you make something good for us? Well, we still have this game engine from 2016 that we used to make Final Fantasy XV, which had mixed reception, but we can reuse it to make another IP if you'd like. Okay, great, let's do it. Oh, and by the way, we want to make sure this game tells a compelling story with great dialogue that really resonates with the reader. Do you think you can find a good writer? Um, well, I th think I know a guy. Great, here's a budget of over 100 million dollars. Now get to work. So, Forspoken was initially slated for release in May of 2022, but in March the studio announced it was going to be delayed to October 11th in order to quote, focus all their efforts on polishing the game. But in July they delayed it again, this time to January 24th of 2023 while they polished the game some more. And after two delays, this game finally released, and this clip of the game started circulating the internet. Did I just do that? Well, definitely with my assistance. I did not just do that. We did. I just move shit with my mind. Perhaps our connection has somehow awoken some abilities. I you shut the fuck up! 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 You see, Forspoken is a weird game. Don't get me wrong, the game isn't extremely terrible. In fact, it has a lot of good qualities and it's obvious Luminous put a lot of passion into making it. The gameplay seems pretty fun with the magic parkour and the spells you can use are pretty cool to mess around with. The devs also put a lot of thought into how the players can upgrade their stats by unlocking new skills and perks. Essentially, Forspoken has a bunch of good ideas, but they don't come together because of its fundamental flaw. The writing. Just the story in of itself seems like someone asked ChatGPT to write a plot for a video game and the studio just rolled with it. Forspoken is just filled to the brim with all these common movie tropes and cliches that make the story incredibly predictable, cringy, and downright boring. Let me show you what I mean. The story of Forspoken follows a troublesome 21 year old girl named Frey, who was orphaned at birth in New York City, forced to live a life of crime just to make ends meet. She's in trouble with the law for being a thief and is in trouble with a group of gang members who find her home in this abandoned apartment building and set it on fire while she's asleep. Frey escapes with her cat, Homer, and left with nothing, she gives her cat away and is seemingly about to commit Sudoku from on top of this sign, but is distracted at the last second by a little magical bird, who leads her to this shiny looking piece of jewelry in this building, which gives off a bright flash when she touches it, sending Frey through a portal to a magical fantasy world called Athia. Is this starting to seem familiar yet? No? Okay, let's move on. After being transported to this fantasy world, she realizes that the piece of jewelry she found is stuck on her wrist, and it gives her these magical powers that lets her shoot rocks and do other cool magical shit. It also talks to her and becomes her companion for the rest of the game that is totally not suspicious or anything. She starts fighting this dragon, who suddenly stops trying to kill her and picks her up, carrying her away and conveniently dropping her off nearby a settlement town called Sapal. She finds out through some people she meets in this town that there are these four magical ladies, called the Tantas, that have ruled over Athia for many years, and they also have their own little golden cuffs that grant them magical powers. And now they are somehow corrupted and are a danger to Athia, so Frey fights them in order to save the people of Sapal. But she finds out that one of these Tantas is her mother who had passed long ago due to the corruption. After killing the third Tanta, her cuff companion absorbs the power from its cuff and detaches himself from Frey, betraying her and revealing that he has been the villain all along. The cuff goes into his true form, revealing himself as Susurus, a demon summoned long ago by a nation that was at war with Athia, before being defeated by the four Tantas, split into four separate pieces, and trapped within the cuffs that each of the Tantas wore on their wrists, in hope of keeping him separated and contained. But over time, these cuffs corrupted the Tantas and turned them into a bunch of assholes, I guess. But now that the Tantas are dead, thanks to Frey, Big Sus Man is free and is now set out to finish his mission and destroy Athia once and for all. Frey, finding out she's powerless without the cuff, is about to get mollywhopped by the imposter, when the dragon from the beginning of the game swoops down and intercepts the blast. It turns out this dragon is Frey's mother, because of course it is. Her mother, who convinces Frey that her powers have lied within her all along because she is a Tanta by blood, takes her back to Sapal to defeat the big sus man, where Frey's mom dies, again, before giving Frey her powers so she can defeat Susurus with the combined power of the four Tantas like she's Thanos getting the last Infinity Stone. She defeats him with this combined power, traps him within her body, and wakes up to the city thanking her for saving them, and Frey then starts talking telepathically to her cat while telling it stuff like, You might think there's nothing left to live for. 
that nobody cares. But the truth is, you matter, even when you can't see it. Don't ask me why she's talking to her cat like that, I'm just as lost as you are. Now, although the plot is extremely predictable at points and is kind of basic for a story game made in 2023, that's not even the worst this game has to offer, because my god is the dialogue and just the rest of the writing in general so much worse. There are some scenarios that Frey is put in where she does stuff that would make no sense for someone to do in her situation, like when she's about to escape from the gang members in an alley and has a gun up to her head, she gives a stupid witty line and gets a handful of sand from out of nowhere and throws it in the face of the person holding the gun. Then she gets over a fence and flips off her pursuers, apparently forgetting that the only thing separating her face and a bullet from the barrel of a 9mm is a fucking chain link fence. And then, when her house is burning down and when a duffel bag with thousands of dollars in it that she desperately needs that will fix all of her problems is sitting right next to her, if you try to pick it up, she'll tell you, Gotta find Homer first. Gotta find Homer first. Like, just chuck it over your shoulder like how a duffel bag is supposed to be carried, that's all you had to do. Then when you take 10 steps out of the room and find your cat, you look back at the room and the whole doorway is in flames and you have to leave the money behind, like it's so stupid. Later on, after Frey gets to Athia and she sees this dragon, she hides from it until it leaves and as she's watching it fly away, she says, Is it gone? Is it gone? Is it gone? What you just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. Everyone in this room is now dumber for having listened to it. You've gotta be kidding me. It's like if in Halo, Master Chief just narrated everything he saw as you were playing. Like if he said, Oh my god, what is that strange ring world sitting in outer space? Or if he discovered the Flood and was like, Oh no, is that the, 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 the Flood? See how annoying and unnecessary that kind of dialogue is? It's basically what Frey does the entire game. Also, on top of her saying the word fuck like a hundred times, she's also a complete asshole for no reason. Try to blend in with the crowd. I could blend in a whole lot better if you shut the fuck up. On the other hand, the voice actor for Frey did a fantastic job making her feel authentic with her emotions and her delivery, but it's just a shame that the writing was done by a 12 year old using ChatGPT, because stuff like this just causes the players to roll their eyes every time she speaks and it creates this big disconnect between the player and Frey, causing her to be one of the most unlikable characters you could ever write into a game, especially for someone who's supposed to be the main protagonist. There is also this section right at the end of the story when Frey's mom is explaining Frey's origin story to her before the final boss fight, but the player is then hand held through a bunch of rooms, forcing you to stand in front of these still-framed character models while you are being dumbed with boring exposition and lore for a whole hour straight. I am not kidding, it takes you an hour of your real time to get through this one section that they throw at you at the game's climax, right before the final boss fight. Technical wise, the performance of this game is kind of iffy as well, with the recommended specs for playing this game on 1440p with 30fps being an RTX 3070, which is insane because this means they want you to spend at least $400 on a GPU just to run this game at 30 frames a second. Now everything considered, on top of the boring boss fights that are just bullet sponges that take forever to get through, or the open world that seems like it has so much much to offer, only for it to feel empty, or how this game is filled with slow paced cutscenes that make you want to hit the skip button every time one plays, this game is just extremely mid. It's hard to get through and I doubt anybody who's played it will ever even think about replaying it considering how dragged out everything is. And one last thing, after Forspoken's underwhelming release, Square Enix made the move to essentially shut down Luminous Productions and absorb their talent for other projects within Square Enix's catalog, basically giving up on Forspoken altogether. And for this game being $70, that's right, this game is $70, I can't help but think that Forspoken is just a huge waste of your time and money. Next up we have the Lord of the Rings Gollum was released on May 25th of 2023 and is a spin-off game centered around Gollum, a character from the Lord of the Rings franchise. But my god was this game bad, like this game was so bad you'd be surprised it wasn't a small $5 indie game. And actually, this game was developed by a studio by the name of Didalic Entertainment, who somehow were able to get the Lord of the Rings licensing rights to make this game, which is $50 on Steam and $60 on console. I usually don't like to harp on games made by smaller studios that seem to have put a lot of passion into a game, but as expensive as this is, I just can't give them a pass here because Dedalic somehow managed to make the most uncohesive, confusing, frustrating, unpolished game they could possibly bless us with. This game has absolutely zero redeemable qualities. Zero. Gollum is the kind of game you'd only have fun playing if you were high on meth, making this the perfect Dreamcast Guy simulator. It's a bloodbath.
Anyways, this game is bad at literally everything it tries to do. The idea of Gollum in of itself is okay, I guess, but everything down to the gameplay, the camera, the graphics, the quest design, and the plot just seem reminiscent of a game from the early 2000s. Except this game is even worse considering how buggy and unfinished it is. This game was even delayed two whole years, and it's still released with game-breaking bugs that constantly break the player's immersion, along with constant stuttering and frame drops even if you are playing on a high-end PC. The gameplay is terrible in many aspects, but what's most obvious is when you look at the quest design. You see, the game starts off with Gollum being caught by the bad guys and thrown into a dungeon to do slave work for the rest of his life. But I am not kidding when I say this game is a literal chore simulator, because all you do for the first few hours of the game is complete chores for other people. One day you'll be told to collect 7 slave tags then you're given the objective to go back to your cell and sleep. Then you wake up the next day and do a puzzle, then go back to sleep again. On top of this, there seems to be a lot of trailing missions and objectives that consist of you following someone from point A to point B for several minutes, which makes the quest design seem very uninspiring. All of this causes the game and its plot to seem very mundane and boring, making the player feel like they're dragging themselves along to finish the game instead of being drawn into the plot like a good game is supposed to make you do naturally. To make matters worse, the controls and the camera make the gameplay incredibly frustrating to deal with, and with this game being mainly focused on platforming, they didn't really seem to care if the platforming worked very well, because on numerous occasions you would try to walk up a little ledge or jump on a platform, only for you to bounce off the edge or an invisible wall and fall to your death. Now pair this with a broken checkpoint system that doesn't even work half the time, or the fact that your game will softlock multiple times during a playthrough, forcing you to restart your game or even the whole level, and you will start to see why this game was received as bad as it was. There is even a section where you're supposed to light up some barrels and a timer will start, and you're supposed to jump onto one of these carts and trigger a small cutscene before the timer goes off and the barrels explode. But for some reason, the devs included a button prompt that the player can interact with that will cause Gollum to pause and look around so the player can get some context as to what they're supposed to be doing. But if you interact with this button prompt like any normal player would do, this will happen. <laughs> I was in a cutscene! <laughs> Put all of these gameplay issues together and you get a perfect mix of broken mechanics and gameplay loops that will more than likely cause the player to lose interest and drop the game before the plot even goes anywhere. Not that it gets very good anyways. One thing that makes this game unique, however, is that sometimes there are these moments where you have to make a big decision, and you're put into this screen where you have to play as one of Gollum's split personalities, and convince the other side, either Gollum or Smeagol, to agree with you on that decision. Not only does this UI look like it was taken straight out of a Word document, but this gameplay element, which on the surface seems like it gives you a say in how the story goes, actually does nothing to change the outcome of anything, other than changing Gollum's facial expressions during these cutscenes to happy or angry. That's it. In no way does this addition make you feel like these decisions matter in any way, ultimately making what could have been a neat little gameplay element into a useless waste of time and energy. There is also a point in the game when Gollum meets this Candleman guy who is supposed to be the main villain of the story, and you are forced by him to do this bird breeding minigame, which serves no purpose but to set up a companion system with the bird that you end up hatching. On top of the fact that Gollum is supposed to eat birds and not raise them, this companion system is probably one of the worst I've ever seen in a game to date, because all you do is switch to companion mode and order them to fetch something for you or flip a lever, which is fine enough until you realize that this system is so janky and ridden with inconsistencies that it will make you audibly groan every time you have to use it to progress through the game. Now, the graphics are about what you'd expect for a game made in 2005. Despite Gollum looking like he's supposed to in the game's trailer back in 2021, they somehow managed to make him look even uglier than that. In the movie, he looks like this. In the game, he looks like whatever the fuck this is supposed to be. You will also come across many visual glitches, like when you're at a certain section in the game, you can see a bunch of orcs walking across these bridges at the bottom of this area. But if you look closely, you will realize that these are just low resolution sprites walking at about 5 frames per second. So obviously this game is pretty bad, there's no question there. But what if I told you that it gets even worse? Well, along with this game being way overpriced, there is also a DLC you can get called the Precious Edition, which is priced at a whopping 70 bucks. For this, you get the full game and, wait for it, an emote pack, a lore compendium, and Sindarin voice acting, so that the elves speak in their lore accurate language instead of English. Not only is putting emotes in the game for $3 dumb enough, but putting a locked lore book in the menu behind a paywall? Nearly every game made since the invention of the flip phone has some sort of lore book or info tab in the menu for free. And with the Sindarin voice acting for the elves, you don't even see an elf until you're more than halfway through the game, and you want us to pay $3? Fuck that. Now, of course, with any game that flops on release nowadays, the developers heard the feedback and issued an apology, where they apologized to fans for how shitty the game was, as they continue to misspell the name of their own game in the very first sentence. 
sentence. They also say that they will be addressing the bugs and technical issues, which I have to say won't make the game any more fun considering a lot of the things that went wrong with the game were put in there by design. In fact, the game would probably be less fun considering the only time anybody actually enjoyed playing the game was when making fun of how dog shit it was. Actually, I had to revise the script for this video after learning that this apology was, according to the game's own developers, written by ChatGPT. So, yeah, you can't get any more 2023 than that. Now, all things considered, this game was doomed from the start and should have never been released in the first place. This game was very obviously rushed and came out half-baked, despite the two-year delay it was given. But on the other hand, I don't think another delay would have changed much. Also, this game flopped so badly that Dedalic Entertainment had to shut down their own development studio as they shifted their focus onto publishing and distribution. Yes, it was that bad. Again, I don't like shitting on a small studio of developers who spent years putting their passion into something they really cared about, but at the same time, you can't play this game without spending at least $50, and that is $50 too much. Now, the next game on my list, and the last one I will get in depth with, thank god, is none other than Redfall is a co-op looter shooter FPS game made by Arkane Austin under Bethesda Softworks and takes place in the city of Redfall, Massachusetts after a scientist turned himself into a vampire before spreading his vampirism throughout the city and breaking off its communication to the outside world. You play as one of four vampire hunters that have to put an end to the vampire's control of the island as well as the human cultists that worship them. At least, that's what I think the story is, since this game is so buggy that you'll end up spending more time looking at a bunch of glitches than getting any real explanation as to what you're supposed to be doing. That is, unless your game crashing 10 times a day doesn't drive you to press the uninstall button instead. First things first, this game should have never seen the light of day. Get it? You know, cause vampires? This game is supposed to be similar to a Left 4 Dead game, but with vampires instead of zombies, but is also an open world game with points of interest where you can do a bunch of quests and stuff. But when I say this game flopped when it launched, I mean this game got absolutely demolished by anybody unfortunate enough to play it, even to the point where IGN gave it a 4 out of 10. The same IGN that gave Forspoken a 6 out of 10 and Battlefield 2042 a 7 out of 10. That's how bad this game was. And as I stated earlier, Redfall was developed by Arkane Austin, the same people behind some great games like Dishonored and Prey. Which leaves me wondering, what the absolute fuck went wrong with Redfall? Well, let me tell you, Redfall is one of the most unfinished games of the last few years. It has an open world that just feels really empty and boring. The gameplay is absolute dog shit in almost every way imaginable. The characters and their abilities and skills offer nothing exciting or unique. The UI is extremely hard to work with, and the story of this game is just a complete snooze fest. And get this, this game has a price tag of $70 and a DLC that adds another 30 to that. Just keep that in mind. First, regarding the storytelling, it mostly takes the form of notepads and books scattered literally everywhere in the world that you have to go up to and interact with to read, which has gotta be the absolute worst way for a game to tell a story. You'll occasionally come across a few points where a bunch of frozen character models will pop up and start talking and you're kind of expected to sit there and listen to exposition for a minute, but other than that, you'll see some cutscene sequences where the camera just pans across the still framed image like a slideshow presentation while someone is talking in the background. And in some of these little sequences, nobody will talk at all and you're just expected to know exactly what's going on. It kind of feels like the budget they got from Microsoft was completely dumped into the trailers that they used to hype up the game, as well as the one and only animated cutscene that happens in the very beginning. It's clear they either didn't care to put much thought into the storytelling, or they just didn't have the budget or time to make them at least a little bit compelling. The quest design isn't much better either, with most of the missions requiring you to run 500 meters across town, clear out a bunch of enemies, take 30 minutes searching for a key to a door, get an item, then run another 500 meters back, clear out some more enemies, and having a 10 second boss fight, because that's how easy the bosses are to kill in this game. Actually, the ending boss fight that concludes the game's story involves a big built up fight between you and this powerful vampire lady called the Black Sun, but in reality, all you do is run around her and go to these three things that's giving her power or something and hold the action button for a few few seconds to untether her from them, which will take out a chunk of her health bar, then after you did that three times, you go to where she's sitting and drive a stake into her, and that's the whole boss fight. Not once in this final boss fight do you actually shoot your gun or use your abilities that you spent all of the game getting, well other than killing a couple vampires that get into your way that you can really just run past because their AI is incredibly stupid. And speaking of the enemy AI, my god does this game have some bad AI. You could be in a fight with an enemy who's just constantly running into an object you're standing behind because their AIs have no sense of pathing whatsoever, which also allows for moments like these. At least the moon ain't really 
The animations for some of the enemies constantly bug out, and you'll very frequently see them hover around or start to run sideways. The human enemies in this game are so dumb and easy to kill that you can just go around punching them and they will just take it and die in a couple hits, even on the highest difficulty. The vampires, on the other hand, are a little more of a challenge, until you realize that all you have to do to avoid their melee attacks is walk backwards and slightly to the left. There is also this wanted system where if you get the attention of enough vampires, they will send a vampire boss called the Rook to fight you. But the enemy AI is so brain dead that all you have to do is stand on top of an object just about shoulder height and this boss will just forget that you exist and you can proceed to shoot him until he's dead. And it's funny considering how IGN did an interview with the creative director at Arcane Austin who had this to say about the game's AI. On top of that, Arcane is known for AI that is sight and hearing based. And so even if your game <coughs> is not a hardcore stealth game, having an AI that's like that just generates gameplay. Mm -hmm. Like you're moving across the world and you're moving into an area, you don't realize that you made a sound back there and somebody's following you now, uh, or you accidentally lead one group of enemies into another group of enemies and they fight, you know. It's like right. that kind of AI is what we do, whether it's Prey or Deathloop or Dishonored or Redfall. What the fuck is this piece of shit? The guns in this game also have this shitty rarity system to them, so you can have the same 10 gun types in your inventory three times over, but the only thing setting them apart from each other are slight stat increases, which don't even matter in the first place considering how you can take out most enemies within a millisecond using the most basic assault rifle in the game. The skills and abilities are underwhelming at times, with one of these characters, Layla Ellison, the telekinetic threat in Student Debt, having the ability to summon a jump pad that will just bounce you into the air, as well as the ability to summon her vampire ex-boyfriend that will briefly fight other vampires for you. One of the abilities belonging to Jacob Boyer, the dead eye with an undead eye, is to send out a raven that will mark enemies for you, since this guy is supposed to fill more of a stealth role. But one of the upgrades you can get for this ability makes it so that every time you send out your raven upon an enemy, it will deal damage to them, which alerts the enemy, thus contradicting the stealth role that this character is supposed to play. So getting this upgrade would make it harder for you to do what the ability is made for in the first place. Like, why did they think this was a good idea? And of course, I can't talk about the disappointment of Redfall, without mentioning this game launching at 30 FPS. The developer promised that it would launch at 60 FPS, but apparently they couldn't even make that happen until the game got a patch five months later. Microsoft and Arkane Austin were so set on having this game release at 60 FPS, in fact, that they had already put 60 FPS on the game's official box art, so they had to put a sticker on every single copy that they distributed to stores all over the world that told people eh, it was actually running at 30, so that they couldn't get sued for false advertising. It is fucking crazy that they had to do that. This was supposed to be Xbox's biggest game of the year so far, at least until Starfield launched in September, but this is all they had to show for it. It makes you think, you know, like, there's no way that anybody at the studio or at Microsoft playtested this game for approval and said, Hey, I think this is pretty good, this game seems finished, we totally don't need to delay this another year. Like, the disappointment that this game brought upon us was even enough to get the head of Xbox, Phil Spencer, on a podcast and apologize to everyone. It was that bad. Apparently, he and the other heads at Microsoft had no idea it was going to be as poorly received as it was, which kind of confuses me since everybody who played Redfall knows for a fact that this game needed at least another six months in the oven. Also, one thing I find pretty funny is that the player count for Redfall on Steam is ridiculously low, sitting at under 50 at average. And I get that Redfall is on Game Pass and most people are playing it on Xbox, but come on, 50? This is a AAA game and it can't even get 100 players on Steam. Okay, now what went wrong with Redfall is pretty clear, I think. Keep in mind that Bethesda was also working on Starfield at the same time Redfall was being developed by one of their smaller studios, Arcane Austin. Arcane Studios has an estimated 150 or so employees, so Redfall was developed by a relatively smaller group of people. And then you have Starfield, one of the most hyped video games of the last few years, being developed with the manpower of over 400 employees. So what I'm getting at here is Bethesda didn't really care about Redfall. This game is just a little side piece for them, you know? But instead of treating the game's budget and its price tag the same way they treated its development, they basically said, ah, fuck it, we'll just release it by the end of quarter two and we'll have more people to work on Starfield. Now, there are also some other games I just wanted to briefly touch on since they're not really worthy of an in-depth look like what I just had to put you through, but it would be criminal to not at least mention them, like some of the latest PC ports of some pretty hyped up games, including one belonging to The Last of Us Part 1, which had some pretty wild glitches like the character's hair and eyebrows freaking out or the character models doing all kinds of weird shit. Also, there was this huge issue at launch where you were forced to sit in the main menu for over 30 minutes for the shaders to compile. 30 minutes! 
That's like when it's really cold outside and you have to start up your car so it can warm up a little bit before you hop in, but instead you're waiting for your game to warm up so it doesn't stutter every time a new object gets rendered. There was also a big issue people had with Star Wars Jedi Survivor, where the PC port of the game was very poorly optimized. You could be running the game on the world's most powerful supercomputer and there was still a 70% chance that your game would run like absolute dog shit. Not only would the game freeze and stutter all the time, but even after the patches went through and this was kind of mostly fixed, there would still be a pretty bad upscaling issue with the character models like with their hair and stuff. Other than that, the game wasn't too bad, but for a game releasing at $70, that kind of comes with an expectation that your game won't run like a PowerPoint slideshow, you know? And of course, we can't have a video covering the effects of modern gaming without talking about Cyberpunk 2077, which will go down in history as having one of the worst launches of any video game to date. Now, Cyberpunk is made by CD Projekt Red, the same people behind the well-known Witcher series, and was first announced with a trailer released all the way back in 2013, a whole decade ago, where they also drop a little bit of satirical foreshadowing. Are you sure about that? Then it got an E3 trailer in 2018 and I gotta tell you, there are only a few games I've ever been this hyped for leading up to its launch than Cyberpunk 2077. I am an absolute sucker for this kind of environment and atmosphere, where you are in a dystopian crime-ridden city filled with neon lights and skyscrapers where it feels like its entire population is only prey to the greedy capitalist enterprises that run it from the shadows. In fact, this game's narrative embodies the idea of being anti-capitalist and anti-establishment, so it's funny that when Cyberpunk fully launched in late 2020, people soon came to find out that the very things that this game's characters and story drive against are the very things that caused this game to have one of the most disappointing launches in video game history. It is true when people say that it kind of became popular and trendy to make fun of the game's bad launch, even if it wasn't as bad as they made it out to be. But at the same time, CD Projekt Red straight up lied to millions of people regarding what was being promised at launch, and some would even call it false advertising. Shit, they even got sued by their own investors for hiding the state of cyberpunk from them, and because its bad launch greatly decreased the value of their stocks, all of which resulted in a settlement for $1.85 million. To sum it up, Cyberpunk was a game filled with a bunch of bugs and glitches that made the game nearly unplayable, at least past the first few hours of gameplay which they wanted to make nice and perfect so that they could trick nearly every review outlet into giving their game perfect scores all across the board. But this game wasn't done just yet, because they've had some patches since launch that got rid of most of its problems. And then came Cyberpunk Edge Runners, an anime from Studio Trigger set in the cyberpunk setting and universe that became an instant hit worldwide, bolstering the game's player count, giving it a second wind if you will. I actually hadn't played Cyberpunk until I watched the anime for the first time, got depressed for a week, then gave the game a shot, and by then, most of the bugs were gone and I realized that Cyberpunk was actually a really good game. There was also a recent update that CD Projekt Red called Cyberpunk 2.0, where they overhauled the game's system so that it finally delivers on the promises they set for it before release. And there was also a DLC that came out around the same time called Phantom Liberty that is absolutely worth playing. So at the end of the day, CD Projekt Red pulled their heads out of their asses, got to work, and now Cyberpunk Cyberpunk 2077 is one of my favorite games of all time, hands down. Speaking of broken promises and disappointing launches, I wanted to very quickly touch on Halo Infinite. If you are a regular on this channel and have seen some of my videos on Halo Infinite, you already know what I'm about to say. But if you are not, consider subscribing to the channel or becoming a member, thank you. Anyways, I fell into the trap that many other Halo fans fell into, thinking that 343 Industries, after failing with Halo 4 and Halo 5 Guardians, would magically turn around and deliver a good Halo game. After all, Halo Infinite was supposed to be a spiritual reboot and a return to what made Halo the FPS giant it was during the original trilogy. Only after launch, it was clear, to me at least, that this franchise fell victim to Microsoft's leadership curse yet again, with it very clearly being rushed out of the door way too early. There was hardly any content at launch, with many of the franchise's popular game modes missing like Infection, Firefight, and Forge just to name a few. The way the UI was designed made it seem like they put zero thought into how the game would evolve in the long run, with the matchmaking playlist only allowing a few games to be in rotation at any given time, like they didn't anticipate the community wanting to play anything more than 4 or 5 select game modes. The customization system was also a step in the wrong direction, with them hyping what up that was supposed to be on the same level as Halo Reach, only for armor pieces that we could unlock and reach for 
afraid to be locked behind a paywall, along with simple armor colors that they turned into coatings as an excuse to make you pay them, like for the color blue for instance. But enough with that, I've already said way too much for now, just go check out my other videos on this subject, the links for those will be in the description. Now although Halo Infinite had a disappointing launch, they are slowly but surely turning it around. Thanks to a ton of player feedback, 343 is finally doing stuff that the players actually want to see. Player base has been at its highest since Season 2, and things are looking bright for now at least. Alright, now considering all of the games I've just gone over, what's the thing that all of them have in common? Well, in my eyes at least, they were mostly rushed into release by their studios and or publishers, which we mainly come to realize after their releases in the form of glitches that break the player's immersion or basic concepts that seem to have no thought put into them whatsoever. But why are more and more games nowadays releasing in such terrible states you ask? Well, ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you about a little something called the Minimum Viable Product. You see, the Minimum Viable Product is a business tactic very frequently used throughout many different kinds of industries in the global economy. Let me read you the definition from Google real quick. <clears throat> A minimum viable product, or MVP, is a product with enough features to attract early adopter consumers and validate a product idea early in the product development cycle. So with this in mind, what do games like Battlefield 2042, Forspoken, Gollum, Redfall, and most of the other games I just mentioned have in common? Well, they were rushed into release despite having delays, but with just enough content there at release to make the game playable at best. You see, while us consumers were booting up Battlefield 2042, Halo Infinite, or Cyberpunk as soon as they released, the heads of the studios that led these games were going to their publishers, who are giving these studios the budget to develop these games, and saying to them, Hey, it looks like people are playing our game, and that means it's a huge success, right? Then the publishers say back, Well done, now here's another 10 million dollars to spend on making Season 2. Now, whether the next project is a new season to the game's life service, a DLC, or even a whole sequel, the publishers will look at the money racked in from the previous title and they will gauge whether it gave them enough profit to make them want to invest more money into it. This is the same case with movies and TV shows. But what makes this most obvious when looking from a video game design standpoint is how much some of these games just want to pry your money right out of your hands. Because have you ever noticed that while a lot of these games are super buggy or devoid of content, they still seem to have an item shop that works perfectly fine and one that will be updated every single week or even daily. Not even that, but it will look nice and pretty and eye-catching and will even have its own special tab at the top of the screen. Like in Halo Infinite's case, the item shop will frequently undergo new UI and design changes so that you will be more enticed to click on it or browse it for a longer time. Kind of like how apples nowadays are coated in wax to make them look shiny so that when you go to the store they are more appealing and you want to buy them. There was even a point where players were complaining about how expensive the items in the shop were which quickly made 343 decrease the prices dramatically, only to slowly increase them again to the point where they were originally. This stuff is the ultimate example of how most AAA games nowadays serve no purpose but to be barely playable at launch, but just enough so that you'll play it for a bit and possibly buy some cosmetics along the way. It's almost as if these games were both pitched and put together with the item shops as the main focus, but with all of its content as a side project that didn't really matter as long as it worked. And this problem is even amplified when you consider how some games are purely pay to win, where you actually have to buy items with real money just so that you can compete with other players. And if you don't give them your money, well, too bad, you're not going to win against the 12 year old using his mom's credit card on power ups that make him impossible to kill. <coughs> Diablo. So with nearly every game releasing in this dark age of modern gaming being either ridden with bugs, very poorly thought out, abandoned right after launch, or just designed to take as much money from the consumer as humanly possible, there is still some light at the end of the tunnel. Thanks to some games that have launched in the past few years, people are starting to remember what it feels like to play a game that's sole purpose is to let the player have fun, rather than something that was made to drive player engagement or to sell you something just to make money off of you. Take Elden Ring for example. Elden Ring was released in 2022 by From Software as a continuation of their Dark Souls franchise, which is widely known for having a harder and more punishing difficulty that you can't alter. But despite this aspect driving many players away from the franchise's previous titles, Elden Ring took the gaming community by storm, becoming an instant hit and selling over 12 million copies worldwide in just 3 weeks. And do you think that people played Elden Ring because it had weekly challenges that made them want to keep playing, or perhaps to grind to unlock cosmetics you can only get in a paid battle pass, or maybe to try out a new game mode that released a few months after the game's initial release? The answer is no. People played Elden Ring because it was fun. Whether it was the impressive art style, the expansive lore, the rich open world, the engaging plot, the extremely memorable bosses, or the challenges that came with every new encounter that never failed to leave the player rewarded. Whoever picked up this game and actually gave it a chance never put it down. It even won Game of the Year and Elden Ring is still going strong over a year and a half after release. 
Another game I want to mention is Baldur's Gate 3, an RPG game set in a Dungeons & Dragons sort of setting. It is developed by Larian Studios and just released in August of 2023. Similar to Elden Ring, Baldur's Gate 3 took the gaming world by storm, not only becoming the highest rated PC game of all time, but also hitting the top 10 games on Steam for most concurrent players of all time at 875,000 players. And apparently one day, Baldur's Gate 3 accounted for almost 28% of total player time on Steam, which means of everyone playing any game on Steam, over a quarter of them were playing none other than Baldur's Gate 3. Do you understand how fucking crazy that is? For someone not familiar with Dungeons & Dragons or someone who's not really into turn-based fighting games, Baldur's Gate might seem like a turnoff, but apparently there are a ton of people who felt the same but absolutely fell in love with this game. The player can choose how the story changes in meaningful ways, the characters and their dynamics are memorable, and the customization is, well, let's just say they gave you a lot of options. This game is simply really good. So good, in fact, that it caused an uproar within game developers who tried to trash on the game, saying that games like Baldur's Gate shouldn't become the new standard for AAA games going forward. Like, bro, this game was developed by a team of 400 employees over many years, while Battlefield 2042 was made with twice as many employees, Cyberpunk with 500 employees, and Halo Infinite with over 750 employees, and all with much higher budgets as well. You can even look at games like Battlebit Remastered, which was developed by only three people. Only three indie developers, and it's free to play. Granted, it took some time to launch, but the game absolutely blew up and has a consistently high player base even to this day. Or even Armored Core 6, which is another title developed by From Software and released just two years after Elden Ring. You see, these games are good because they were built with passion and weren't rushed to meet some deadline. They took a good amount of time to make, and despite them being mainly focused on a single player experience, they are still doing just as well as every AAA multiplayer first person shooter has for the last several years. Oh, and they're also $60 or less. Not the $70 pieces of shit we seem to be getting nowadays. And if you think about it, these games didn't release with a bunch of game-breaking bugs, didn't fall short on the promises that were made hyping up the game, and don't have a single microtransaction in them whatsoever. All it takes to have the full experience is just a one-time purchase. And these studios and their publishers are still reaping the benefits. They are rolling in gold coins right now because they knew that making a good game at its core will sell just as much as a game that grips at every opportunity to sell you something. In fact, Larian Studios even said when releasing Baldur's Gate 3 that, no, there are no in-game purchases in our game. We believe in providing a complete and immersive gaming experience without the need for additional purchases. Enjoy the game to its fullest without any additional costs or microtransactions. And this is what developers studios and their publishers should take from games like Elden Ring and Baldur's Gate 3. You don't need to try your absolute hardest to make money by loading your game with monetized cosmetics or pushing for people to buy your battle pass or even making your game pay to win. You just need to make a good game that people will enjoy and the money will come naturally and there will be a lot of it. So instead of cutting corners and using half your budget and workforce and all that bullshit, do what From Software and Larian Studios did and make something that people will just naturally enjoy because of the passion that you put into it. And also, take your fucking time. I still don't understand why all these publishers are pushing their games to release way too early, knowing it's going to be broken and knowing nobody's gonna like it. So just suck it up, give the studio another 6 months at least, and release it in a better state. Then when it's actually playable, people will play it and they will enjoy it. So then more people will see this and say, hey guys, this game's good. And then even more people will play it. That's how good games do well and that's how they make money. It was the same for games made 10-20 years ago and that's why first party games from PlayStation and Nintendo do well on release every year. It's because they have passionate studios that work on player experience and not on taking your money. And I'm not going to pretend that their main goal isn't to make money because at the end of the day it's all business one way or another, but the difference here is that they don't grip at every opportunity to, you know? They just know what people will enjoy and they know focusing on that when making their game will give them what they want. Now with all that said and done, I think you guys get what I'm trying to say here. I know this video is way longer than it needs to be, but after seeing all these big franchises and big names in game development fall to corporate greed, I've just been building up all this frustration and felt the need to get my word out, you know? And I'm sure you guys feel the same way, but if you don't, feel free to talk shit about me in my comment section, dislike the video, and also subscribe to the channel so you can continue to hate on my next videos and live streams. Also, feel free to become a member of the channel if you're an extremely sick individual, and I will see you next time. This is Zombie, signing out.